men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but they cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, praise the Lord. O house of Aaron, praise the Lord. O house of Levi, praise the Lord. You who fear him, praise the Lord. Praise be the Lord from Zion. To him who dwells in Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to United Church of Huntington, those that are new. And speaking of new, uh, my friend Frank and Gabby Airy, uh, Gabby Airy, how about Carrie Abby, are here this morning. So if you have a chance from six feet, say hello to them. Good morning. We have a dedication this morning of a, of a Philip baby, so
officially welcoming a new child into this congregation. And uh, invite Chris and Joe Phillips to come forward with their family. Mark 10, 13 through 16, we hear people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Chris and Joanne, you have come this here this morning to dedicate this child to the service of our Lord and Savior and receive his blessing on your family. Dedication, like any ceremony or ordinance, does not impart salvation. We are saved by the mercy and the grace of God which we receive through faith in the Lord Jesus. What we do here this morning marks a commitment to raise this child to believe in Jesus, to love Jesus, and to follow Jesus. What is the name of this child? Chris and Joe, I'll ask you on behalf of Clayton, do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you entrust Clayton to his care and dedicate him to his service? If so, say I do. Do you commit with the help of this congregation to teach Clayton to be a faithful disciple of Jesus? So say I do. And do you, the people of God gathered here, promise to support this family with your prayers, your example, and your ministry as they undertake this commitment? If so, say, we do. We do. Clayton Ryan, we dedicate you to the Lord Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that you might serve him as his faithful disciple. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. May he watch over your life, guide you and guard you, now and forevermore. Amen. us back to their seats. Let's sing together. <clears throat>
these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we pray also under the pattern that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are still not back to uh, passing the offering plates yet, but you may have noticed that the offering plate was there at the, uh, the entrance when you came in this morning. If you missed it, there will be one there on your way out also. I'd like to invite the praise team up to lead us in the doxology as our elders bring the offering forward as we present this to the Lord. Let's stand and sing here. <laughs> Let us pray. 
Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you open it to us, the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand what you are saying to us. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be here upon me, in the ears and the hearts and the minds of all who listen, so the things that are spoken today, the things that are heard and remembered and taken to heart, might not be from me, Lord, but from you. We pray all these things in the words of my mouth, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Two co-workers arrived at the office at the same time, and the one said to the other, How's it going today? Well, said the other, my daughter's mad at me. Well, why is that? asked the first one. I asked her to give me the phone book. She laughed at me, called me a dinosaur, and lent her her iPhone. Okay, so what's the problem? asked the coach. Well, now the spider is dead, the iPhone is broken, and my daughter is furious at me. <laughs> Jesus tells him, yes, 
You get it. The Father, open your eyes to the truth. I'm going to build my church on this truth. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. And you, Peter, you're going to lead the charge. Don't tell anybody about it yet. But that's what's going to happen. This is the same realization, incidentally, that you and I come to when we first believe in Jesus. God opens our eyes to the truth of who Jesus is. We respond in faith and proclaim that Jesus is the King. This is the pattern that Paul talks about in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Peter gets it. But as Matthew continues, there's this whiplash-inducing turnaround. Just a few verses later, Jesus says to the same Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. And this goes from, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven to get behind me, Satan. That was quick. What sparks the change here is Peter's failure of understanding. Even though he believes in Jesus, he's got a flawed notion of what Jesus is up to. In fact, he even encourages Jesus to turn away from the path that will bring salvation. And this is why Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You might remember from earlier in the Gospels, before Jesus embarks on his public ministry, he goes into the wilderness. He's going to fast, spend some time with God, and Satan shows up and tempts him. And each one of those temptations that Satan provides is for Jesus to use his power to make things easier. To accomplish the mission that God has given him in a way that will not result in suffering or in difficulty, or rejection. And Peter's doing the exact same thing. He's saying, no, look, it's not going to happen to you. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to be rejected by the authorities. You don't have to die. Jesus understands, yes, I do. Because that is the way of the kingdom of God. It's not about me. It's about surrendering to the Father. Just as Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But Peter is still thinking in the world's terms. The ultimate triumph of the kingdom of God and your opportunity to be a part of it comes through Jesus' suffering and death and resurrection. And Jesus explains this to his disciples. He's not going to bring in the kingdom of God by popular acclaim. He's not going to be acknowledged by the leaders of God's people and then lead them in victory against Rome. The world says that's how you come up on top and deliver your people. You start a revolution. That's what many first century Jews expected the Messiah to do. In fact, it's how many people still expect progress to happen today. I don't know if you caught the news this week, but the big news from Cuba is that Raul Castro retired as head of the Communist Party of Cuba. And that's kind of a big deal because it marks the first time since 1959 that a Castro has not held the reins of power in that country. The Castro brothers were as successful as you can get in the revolution business. They spearheaded a guerrilla movement that toppled the former regime in the name of progress and equality. They started small, built a movement, won victories, and ultimately established this communist state that persists to this day. And people around the world, and even in our own country, want to emulate them. But the reality of what Fidel and Raul and Che Guevara accomplished doesn't match what they promise. Despite reorganizing and dominating the Cuban economy and removing the former ruling class, 
They did not create a worker's paradise. In fact, Cuba is notorious for its lack of freedom and abuse of human rights. One Cuban-American critic has described Castro's Cuba as an impoverished island prison. Communism is one of those things that makes a lot of sense from a world's perspective, from the perspective of human wisdom. But it just doesn't work. You can look at the track record all over the world. It doesn't work. The revolutionary model of progress falls short of real deliverance. That's true whether it's about communism or any other political ideology, because it doesn't understand the real problem. Jesus tells Peter, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Power and politics and economics all have their place. Some systems are certainly better than others at encouraging human flourishing. But the real cause of suffering is spiritual. If you replace one set of sinful leaders or one sinful system with another, all you get is a different sort of suffering. Jesus doesn't take on the role of political messiah that so many people expected, because he came to address the root cause behind the political dysfunction and oppression. He doesn't take on the role of military savior, because he came to fight a far more significant battle. The gospel is good news because it announces a solution to the problem of sin. Jesus offers forgiveness, possible only because he paid for your sin on the cross. And he shows us a way forward when he proclaims the kingdom of God. When you live under God's reign and rule, instead of trying to run everything yourself, you find freedom from the sin that so closely accompanies even the best human intention. But if you're still thinking according to the world's perspective, according to, to human concerns, you're going to miss a kingdom understanding, just like Peter did. This is true whether we're talking about how to approach the big issues of the day, the things that grab the headlines, or how to approach the personal challenges that happen in the course of day-to-day -day life. Even if you know who Jesus is, and believe in him, and want to follow him, you're going to get off track if you aren't transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need a gospel-shaped understanding. And I understand that this is a little abstract, but providentially, Scripture gives us some very practical advice on how to get and keep a gospel-shaped understanding. First, you have to know and remember where your hope comes from. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, Paul writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. If you believe in Jesus, you share in Jesus' resurrection life, the new life. And your old life, bound by sin and bedeviled by failures, has passed away. Your future is with Jesus. This is a very freeing truth. And when you embrace it, it puts your worries about the present or the near-term future in proper perspective. Even though you live and work and serve in the here and now, setting your mind on things that are above, where Jesus sits and reigns the right hand of the Father, keeps you focused on the bigger picture, the gospel picture. Secondly, focus on what is good. You have a limited attention span. For some of us, it's more limited than others. 
If you were just thinking about who the Browns might take in the first round of Thursday's draft, I'm talking to you. <laughs> All of us, though, we, we only have the capacity to think about so many things. And if you focus on the negative, there's a lot of that out there, you can get discouraged very quickly. You can even become absent-minded about the good news that God still reigns and that he has a plan and he is carrying it to completion because all that other stuff is just driving that out of your head. All good things come from God. And so Paul writes in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about <clears throat> such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. What you think about affects what you do, affects your attitude, affects your actions. So think about what is good and what you have learned from those who taught you about Jesus. Keep that in your mind. Then your gospel understanding will translate into gospel living. Finally, beware of distraction. Many ways of understanding the world may at first seem appealing. But when you really look at them, you recognize they are not compatible with the gospel. And at other times, there are views or thoughts that we know are not compatible with the gospel, but anger or despair or some other strong emotions might drive you to entertain them. This is why Paul, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, writes, We take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. In other words, your mind does not have a mind of its own. It is yours. And you have the ability to direct your thoughts. And when you find your thoughts wandering in a way that is not honoring to God, you need to reel those in and recenter, refocus on Jesus Christ. You maintain a gospel understanding by keeping your thoughts in line with Jesus. That doesn't mean you can never ask questions. It means that you keep obedience to Christ as your goal. And you build your understanding of the world around what he has revealed to us. If you are model of how the world works, or who God is, or how we ought to be in the world, doesn't fit with what Jesus taught, you need to go back and reevaluate your understanding. Again, a gospel-shaped understanding is not our default setting. It's not entirely natural. That's why you need a transformation through the renewing of your mind. None of this happens without God's intervention. He is the one who breaks into the world to save you. And he is the one who reveals, and he is the one who renews. So let's pray that God will enlighten us through his word and his spirit. So that we can have a gospel-shaped understanding. We don't have, want to have minds set on human concerns or formed by the ideologies of the age. We'll dig more into what that looks like here in the next couple of weeks. But pray to be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that we can understand not just the world and God and these abstract ideas, but understand what we are to do and who we are to be. The glory of God as his kingdom people in this place. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this.
the salvation that you have given us through Jesus. And we pray also that you will continue your work in us by transforming, renewing our minds, that we may see clearly and truly that we might have a gospel-shaped understanding in order that we may have a gospel-shaped life. Lord, be with us now as we gather here around the table, as we prepare our hearts to partake in the bread and the cup, these symbols of your body and blood. We confess, Lord, that we do not approach the table because we are righteous or wise or have figured all things out but only because you have poured out your mercy upon us. We confess, Lord, that we have fallen short in so many ways. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. But yet you still love us. You offer mercy and grace and a path of reconciliation for us to walk. Lord, be with us now, we pray, and meet us in this act of communion. Turn these elements to an ordinary use, to a sacred use in this time. That we may be blessed. That we may be nourished spiritually in the journey ahead. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are welcome at this table to share in the bread and the cup. As we gather here, we remember the heart of our faith. Why we gather. Why we have hope. We remember on the night he was arrested. Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ was broken for you. And we remember this truth.
It is wonderful to see so many people here this morning. Once again, we would ask that if you want to uh, talk and visit afterwards, uh, head towards the parking lot, and uh, let's do that outside so we can kind of keep the air flowing through here. We want to keep everybody as uh, safe from this nice little bug as we can. Now may you go forth in the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and may he be your vision today and always. Amen.